the 180-page report overseen by Professor Hal Abelson claims the school never targeted Aaron Swartz for allegedly hacking into its network and downloading millions of scholarly articles. MIT uh, actually wasn't seeking anything. MIT took the position, as we quote in the report, that this was a legal dispute between the U.S. attorney and Aaron Swartz. In its report, MIT says it did not ask the feds to prosecute Swartz and didn't even know it was Swartz who downloaded the articles until his arrest in 2011. MIT described its position on Swartz prosecution as neutral at the time, but admits in hindsight that the government's stance was overly aggressive. I really think that neutrality was appropriate at the beginning of the prosecution where one can ask a little bit deeper is, as this went on for, gosh, a year and a half, should MIT have gotten more involved and think about what it was doing? And we didn't see that happening. But Swartz's father, Robert, says MIT was not neutral. He tells the New York Times that while MIT had done a good job collecting and presenting the facts, the school should have advocated on his son's behalf. I'm joined now by attorney Harvey Silverglate and former U.S. attorney Michael Sullivan. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for coming in. So MIT has investigated itself and declared itself basically not, not guilty here overall with a few little maybe reconsiderations. What do you think? Do you buy this, Harvey Silverglate? Well, I'm a little kinder toward MIT than, than I think uh, the, your question suggests. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> Hal Abelson was given leave to do whatever he needed to do and mm -hmm. wanted to do. He didn't see his job as looking to condemn anybody. He wanted to get the facts on the table. I, I read the report very quickly today. He did a good 180 job. 180 pages. It's a big report. Yeah, it was, it was, I skimmed it very quickly. He did a very good job of pulling together all of the facts. He didn't draw conclusions, but there are little hints there that if he were in charge, MIT would have been more helpful to Aaron Schwartz than it was. And I agree with uh, that. I think that MIT did not do what it could have and should have done to try to tone down the fanaticism, really, of the U.S. attorney's prosecution of this kid. Well, I've talked to Harvey so great before about this. I know he's no fan of the way Carmen Ortiz's office prosecuted this. You're a former U.S. attorney. One of the big sticking points, of course, was that even with the plea bargain offer, we were always talking about jail time, at least six months' time in jail for this young man. He could have been in jail for decades. Would you have done the prosecution the same way Carmen Ortiz did if you were still in the U.S. attorney's office? Yeah, you know, I think it's easy to sit here and second guess, you mm -hmm. know, decisions that were you know, made, you know, based on a moment in time. And I think everybody would agree it was a real tragedy that Aaron Schwartz took his, uh, his own life. Um, you know, the question about what charges to bring, obviously it's, you're, you, you take an oath, you bring charges that are provable based on the, uh, the evidence. Certainly uh, MIT had a role to play. I think they did everything proper during the course of the law enforcement response. Um, obviously, they realized that there was a cyber attack into their system mm -hmm. that could have been extremely potentially harmful. In fact, I think one of the portals that they saw open to China, they're not sure exactly what the, uh, the extent of the hack was. So the law enforcement response, I think, was most appropriate. The question then becomes, what do you need to do in terms of prosecution, if anything at all? And there should have been some dialogue between the U.S. Attorney's Office and MIT as the victim in the case. Now, certainly MIT is not going to um, determine what charges are going to be brought, but MIT's voice would be very powerful in terms of the position that the U.S. Attorney's Office would And take. they did not, they, they make, maintain that they were neutral. The place that was hacked, the JSTAR <clears throat> place, said don't, don't go ahead with this prosecution. MIT never said don't go ahead with this prosecution. Right, JSTAR really saw that this could be a disastrous prosecution yep. and they discouraged it. MIT stayed neutral, probably to its own detriment. That they should have advocated more for, for <clears throat> this, this young man's sports. But the issue is, again, we're, we're, we're looking at this Whitey Bulger trial now. You know, we have people that Monterano killed 20 people, gets 12 years. Kevin Weeks assisted in burying bodies, gets five years. They're looking at, at, at six months minimum for a plea bargain of guilty and they're talking about 30 years for if this place went, case went to trial. The average person is looking at this Michael Sullivan, former U.S. attorney, and saying, what are we talking about? Well, first off, there's no way that Aaron Schwartz would ever get 30 years. But he might in terms of six sentence. months with the plea. Well, we Jail don't know time. that. I mean, we don't know that because I don't think we've fully heard from the U.S. Attorney's Office in terms of you know, what they might have been willing to do in terms of some type of plea negotiation. Well, what we have, 
we have the MIT report. Right. There's no evidence at all that they spoke with the U.S. Attorney's Office in terms of what the U.S. Attorney's Office might have been prepared to do in terms of something less than six months. Now, again, and, and it's easy to sit here and second-guess people's decisions that they made. But had MIT been uh, a stronger advocate against jail time, mm -hmm. the U.S. Attorney's Office may have been persuaded. I know there were many instances you know, in which the victim would come in and make a passionate plea about some type of resolution, and it would resonate with the assistants in the office. Okay, so Michael Sullivan is basically saying MIT was more at fault here. You're saying well, the U.S. Attorney's say Office is more at fault. Well, I, I think MIT really could have done more, but the truth of the matter is we're never going to hear from the U.S. Attorney. I know that's easy to, you know, we're sitting here criticizing, I am anyway, the U.S. Attorney's Office, but the truth is they're never going to have to say, being a U.S. Attorney means never having to say not only you're sorry, but anything, and that's a real problem in the system. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I get back to this idea of a first offense. Uh, many people were debating how big of a crime this was with someone with a clean record. You know, you know this. People don't go to jail on first offense for almost right. anything. So why this 26-year-old wasn't doing it for money, wasn't doing it for personal gain? I guess even in a plea bargain, how do you justify six months in jail, especially with the psychiatric history of depression? I'm not here to um, uh, defend the U.S. Attorney's Office. I'm not here to criticize the U.S. Attorney's Office. But um, it, it could be that they're looking at it from a deterrence perspective, whether or not you know this type of behavior is, could be so or has been so disruptive mm -hmm. you know, to the private sector in terms of hacking that you want to send a message. Could the message have been sent with something less than six months? That's possible. Again, n none of us were participating in any of the, the uh, negotiations or discussions about what would be the appropriate outcome. Now, when I took over the office, one of the people I met with was Don Stern. And he said um, he would allow victim companies to come in and make a presentation about whether or not they wanted to pursue a, a federal prosecution mm -hmm. about a matter in which they've been harmed. But the victim company was also JSTAR. They didn't want a prosecution. But that's only one victim. Okay. One victim was heard from. And again, I'm not here to criticize MIT either. MIT took a position at that point in time that they believed was neutral. And by uh, taking a neutral position, they believed that they were sending no signals at all to the United States Attorney's Office. It could be by not saying anything at all. They were actually sending a signal to the U.S. Attorney's Office that the path that the U.S. Attorney's Office was on was being supported by do, MIT. Do you agree with it's that? I absolutely agree with Mike on that. Absolutely. One last thing. If there were some uh, ability for a plea bargain to not result in any kind of jail time, wouldn't we have heard this by now, given the amount of criticism Carmen Ortiz's office has gotten? There was no offer that would have involved no jail time. That's that's what I thought. And again, I think that's what uh, got, under, got under everybody's skin here. You just ran for office. You think Carmen Ortiz, if she decides to run for governor, if some people have said she would, will be hurt by uh, this story? Um, I think Carmen Ortiz has done, has done a very good job as a United States attorney. Um, not every matter that's um, being investigated by her office uh -huh. gets to her desk. Okay. At some point in time, um, MIT could have asked for a meeting with Carmen Ortiz and laid out what they would like to see the outcome of the case to be. we got to go, but do you think this would hurt Carmen Ortiz should she run for another elective office, yes uh, or no? It will hurt Carmen Ortiz if she runs, yeah. Okay. Michael Sullivan, former U.S. Attorney, thank you very much for coming in tonight. Harvey Silverglade, always great to talk to you.